Let's now go over our second application of Faraday's law, where the magnetic flux is going to change because the area through which we have magnetic flux changes with time. And this is a very classic example called the rod on rails example. And what you have are two parallel conducting rails separated by a distance L and connected here with a conducting wire that has a light bulb that has resistance capital R. And you then take this conducting rod here and you pull it across the parallel rails. And as you do that, the light bulb lights up. And we sort of understand conceptually why that might be the case because we talked about the conducting loop moving through a magnetic field. But let's just go through the whole thing again and find the direction of I induced and then we'll find the magnitude of I induced. So first things first, do we have magnetic flux? Yes, we do. We have magnetic flux through this area here, and this area increases as the rod moves to the right, which means that the magnetic flux increases because as the rod moves to the right, more magnetic field lines go through this surface now, meaning that phi B must increase. So phi B, the magnetic flux, is directed into the page and is increasing. By Lenz's law, the induced current has to create an induced magnetic field that opposes this increase into the page, meaning that it must create B induced that points out of the page to oppose the increase in magnetic flux into the page. And the only way that you get B induced pointing out of the page by the right hand rule is if I induced, the induced current, flows around this circuit here counterclockwise. And so through the conducting rod here, you're going to get I induced going up through the rod. Gives you B induced pointing out of the page, and that's consistent with Lenz's law. Fair enough. So there is an induced current. Let's try to quantify its magnitude. Now, we know that Faraday's law is always our starting point, and we have to get epsilon induced first, and then we're going to see how we go from epsilon induced to I induced. So first things first, let's evaluate the flux itself. We need to compute the flux through this area here. And we have a uniform magnetic field, so it's going to be pretty straightforward, but we do need one more dimension for this rectangular area. Let's call this x because it increases as the rod moves to the right, and so x seems like a good name for this. The magnetic flux through this area is going to be the double integral of b dot dA. And we've said before that dA could point into the page or out of the page here, it just has to be perpendicular to the surface, and it could go either direction because it's not a closed surface, so there's no requirement. But if I can pick any direction, I'm going to pick dA into the page so that it points in the same direction as the magnetic field B and I get cosine of zero instead of cosine of 180. So we're going to get the double integral of B cosine of zero dA. Cosine of zero is one, B is uniform, so it comes out of the integral. And if we integrate dA over this rectangular area, we get the surface area, which is going to be the product of the side lengths. That's L multiplied by X. That's our magnetic flux. Fair enough. By Faraday's law, epsilon induced is going to be minus d phi b dt. And that's minus d dt of BLX. Now B is uniform, so in magnitude it's constant. Um, L is constant, and the only thing that changes is X. So we're going to get minus BL dx dt is minus BL, well, V, because it turns out that dx dt by definition is V. Now you have to be careful here because it's assumed that you can produce this on your own. And typically, we're never gonna call that X for you. That's on you. 
you have to know to call that x, and you have to know that eventually it's going to tie to the velocity v that you have and that you move the rod with. So here we have epsilon induced. Now what does this mean? It means that as the rod moves across these rails, we get an EMF, an induced EMF, around this entire loop. And effectively, it is as if this conducting rod were behaving like a battery. And so you can draw the equivalent circuit of this um, loop here by drawing a resistor on the left, because the light bulb has resistance R, and a battery on the right. It's just that you're going to say that this battery, so to speak, has a voltage epsilon induced. So this is called the equivalent circuit. And you know that you have I induced flowing counterclockwise through the circuit. And now you can use everything you know about circuits, which is kind of nice. That's the nicest way to find I induced. I mean, technically, you could argue that the loop has resistance R because of the light bulb, and so you just apply Ohm's law. But if you get a more complicated loop, and we'll see a few problems like that, you might be better off just drawing the equivalent circuit and applying the loop law and making sure you don't forget something. So let's apply the loop law. The loop law says that epsilon induced minus VR is equal to zero. In other words, that epsilon induced is equal to VR, which is R times I induced by Ohm's law. And really what we should do, to be thorough here, we should put absolute values around epsilon induced because we do have this minus sign here. And we've mentioned it before, the minus sign doesn't really tell you much. It could be tied to the direction of the induced current, but really what you care about is the magnitude of epsilon induced most of the time. And so your induced current, which you already know flows counterclockwise, is going to be absolute value of epsilon induced divided by R. And you get a very classic result, which is that I induced is B L V divided by R. And so this is a really good example, and it's worth being comfortable with it and understanding how you apply Lenz's law, how you compute flux, how you get epsilon induced, how you find I induced, because it's really kind of the baseline for a lot of exam problems. You can build on this very simple rod on rails problem and add a whole bunch of stuff. You can add some resistors to the loop. You could do other stuff. You could have one moving rod or two moving rods that could move in the same direction or opposite each other. I mean, you can get creative. It doesn't make the problem that much harder, but it's hard to navigate if you've never seen this example and you don't realize that this is a classic. So I would encourage you to think about this one and make it make sense. And we'll see that there are similar problems that we can do in, when we do practice problems that'll help us kind of get a good grasp on this type of problem in general. Thanks for watching this video. At Congress Academy, we create custom study guides so that you don't have to. Send us your syllabus and some old exams, and we'll put together lecture notes, practice problems with step-by-step -step solutions, and classic exam questions so that you don't waste your time. All you have to do is log in and focus on studying what matters most. And if you have questions, we're available to help. If you'd like to learn more about how Congress Academy can help you do well, check us out at congressacademy.com. We look forward to helping you. See you there.